Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, if you're watching from the other side of the Atlantic or listening off in the future at some point. I'm Victoria Moran, and this is Enchanted April, day 15. April 15th used to be tax day. Now it's today. So welcome to everybody who is taking part in this. I want to thank you for giving me something to get up for. Hey, Rachel, you're so often my first person every morning. It means so much to have you here. Hi, Patricia. So I'm having my sparkling water with a splash of pomegranate juice, and I put it in a stem goblet just because you're coming over. You know how much better we treat guests than we treat ourselves. And so you're really inspiring me to do things like get out the stem goblet. Now, I should know this because I remember writing in one of my books, if you get up in the morning and make yourself fresh juice, great thing to do, especially the green stuff, how much more work is it to put it in a stem goblet rather than a plastic superhero's cup from the Taco Bell? And so this morning I am following my own advice. See, I even put little lemon slices in there. I absolutely would not have done that without you guys to inspire it. So thank you so, so very much. Our quotation for, for the day comes from Younger by the Day, and it says, be every ounce the person you are. The more add-ons and ought-tos that you can strip away, the more unique and admirable you'll be. So I invite you, even in, uh, oh, Rob, bless your heart. Rob Mills, great composer, just gave me a compliment. Thank you. I will carry that with me today. So I would love to read in the comments, what add-ons and ought-tos have you dropped? Maybe earlier in your life, maybe just this month during what we're going through with COVID-19. How are you different, but really, how are you more yourself? I think we pick up a lot of uh, add-ons and ought-tos in childhood, and we probably get a ton of them in adolescence, but it's amazing how many we carry around. And what I see is that nowadays, it's a little bit harder to be absolutely ourselves and stand up for what we want to stand up for because so many people are watching. So many people will never see. So many online people and friends who sometimes don't act very friendly. And so it takes a lot of courage sometimes to step out there. It also takes some restraint to figure out, is this something I even want to step out there with? Maybe in a particular case, it would just be better if I kept my opinions to myself and watched what other people had to say about it. So there are all kinds of things that we're juggling these days. Something that I did last week was send out in my Main Street Vegan newsletter a list of the 12 most inspirational songs that I'm listening to uh, these days. Delight Davis, hey, how are ya? Um, and one of the songs was If They Could See Me Now from Sweet Charity. And a lovely woman, very committed animal rights person, I admire her so much, wrote to me and said, did you know that in that song, If They Could See Me Now, they allude, allude to fur? Well, yeah, I knew that. When I was listening recently as I was putting that list together, it really jumped out at me because obviously now and for the past several decades, that has been an issue that I'm very aware of. I know the horrible cruelty involved in the fur industry, and I know that we not only should not be supporting it, we should be actively fighting it, which I certainly believe I have been doing for a long time. And yet, that song was written for a show that premiered on Broadway in 1966. You know, most of us didn't know what we know now, if indeed we were living then <laughs> with the people who were. So I'm gonna tell you a couple of little first stories because that just came up. So Sweet Charity premiered in 1966 and Christmas of that very year, I was 16, and there was a great big box under the Christmas tree. It was from my dad and when I ripped it open, it was a coat to end all coats. It was made of leather and it was made of fur. Now, I had had inklings about 
animal issues. I had dropped out of biology class in my sophomore year because I didn't want to dissect. But I had that cognitive dissonance that we all have to different degrees at different times in our life when I didn't connect that code and the hideous cruelty that it had caused to how I was feeling about owning it. Good morning, Starlet. And so I wore the coat and I liked wearing the coat. And on my 18th birthday, I moved to London and I brought that coat with me, even though it doesn't get that cold in London, didn't really need a coat like that. But one autumn morning, there was a little early frost and I tripped, slipped on a piece of ice and fell horribly onto the sidewalk with the kind of embarrassment that you can only have when you're a teenager and realized then that I had not only fallen splat, but I had fallen into a rather phenomenally gargantuan pile of dog poo. So imagine if you want to or don't, <laughs> if it's too gross, dog poo and fur. It was completely disgusting. And in my disgust with the situation and with myself, I heard the voice of God. And God said to me, you're a vegetarian with a fur coat. That's crap. And that was when I woke up on that issue. Never ever to have a coat made from fur or leather again. But you know what? It still took me years to get over wool. Needed to learn more about that. I hid behind the idea that um, you have to cut the sheep's wool or they'll get too hot and that it's just like a haircut. It's not just like a haircut. But before I knew that, I didn't know it. So I tend to come down on the side of allowing people their ignorance for the time that they had it and pushing for awakening now that we know about that. So on the awakening side, I wanna tell you another first story. I think most of you know that in the past year, Queen Elizabeth announced that she would never again wear fur. Now I know you could say, well, it sure took her long enough. Yeah, I know. But I also love the idea that somebody in her 90s can actually make a big lifestyle change. I love that. That means where there's life, there's hope. But way back in the early 1950s, when Queen Elizabeth was about to have her coronation, invitations went out to all of the people who were supposed to be there, and invitations went to Lord Dowding and his wife, Muriel the Lady Dowding. Now, if you remember your World War II history, Chief Air Marshal Lord Dowding is credited with masterminding the Battle of Britain. So he is buried in Westminster Abbey and there's a stained glass window for him. He was quite a hero of, of that era and later um, met Muriel, they married, and Muriel was one of the first people to find out about the cruelties involved in cosmetics. So she started the Beauty Without Cruelty charity and then the Beauty Without Cruelty cosmetic company with a, another wonderful colleague. So when these invitations came for the uh, coronation, it was also understood that you had to dress just like everybody else at your level of peerage. And at their level, they were supposed to wear these very specific ermine robes. Well, that's fur, obviously. And they were not gonna do that, so you know what they did? They found somebody who knew who could procure faux ermine. In, what was the coronation? Somebody tell me, somebody English, 1952? 1953, a long time ago, they got fake fur. 
And I was lucky enough when I was researching my first book, Compassion, the Ultimate Ethic, to get to go to England and meet lots of those wonderful pioneers of animal rights and, and veganism in that country. And I got to go to Lady Dowding's home and sit down with her and she showed me the photo albums and she showed me the coronation and herself and her husband in robes that looked like everybody else's, but theirs were cruelty free. So hope you like that story. I love telling stories. Now, I also wanted to share something else with you today because I know that the um, uh, dance shoes <laughs> were a big hit yesterday. So when I think of it and when I come up with something that I really truly like, I'm gonna share that with you in our two weeks that are left of Enchanted April. So this, I don't know how close you can see. I'm, I'm not a good lighting person, but Lord knows I'm learning. Anyway, this is called Bright Eyes Eye Cream, infused with caffeine and hibiscus, and it comes from The Fanciful Fox. So The Fanciful Fox is a wonderful body care shop in Brooklyn. It's a mother-daughter team. The daughter is a graduate, I'm proud to say, of, of Main Street Vegan Academy. Her mom actually formulates all of these fabulous natural products on the lower level of their brick and mortar space in Brooklyn. And what is magical about this is it's only for morning. They've even said, don't wear it at night, it might keep you up. But you put this stuff around your eyes in the morning and honestly, if you happen to have crow's feet and lines and wrinkles and other things you're not thrilled about, it sure makes them hibernate for a little while. So you can check them out at, I believe it's The Fanciful Fox, and then there's a Shopify in there. So just Google Fanciful Fox and I'll post the um, URL. Also, if you wanna get yourself some fabulous eye cream, I highly recommend it. So today we are talking about being every ounce the person you are. The more add-ons and ought-tos you can strip away, the more unique and admirable you will be. So, oh gosh, Phil, I didn't know Queen Elizabeth had a lambskin toilet seat cover. My goodness, but you know, it's funny you would bring that up. <laughs> Speaking of toilet seat covers, there is a wonderful artist. I think she's up in New England and a great friend of mine was trying to help her get some work and advertise and that. And her specialty are these amazing toilet seat covers. I think her company is called Toy Lux, T-O-I-L-U-X-E. And this was, I don't know, five, six, I don't know, seven years ago. And going through all these wonderful toilet seat covers, there was one from the gay 90s, the 1890s um, period when it was really awful in so many ways. People were very rich and very poor, sure had great music. And this was uh, a young woman, topless, uh, fabulous hair, looking very 1890s. And I pressed click. But you know what? I've thought about that since. That even though that young woman is far from this world, she was exploited way back then. I don't think she wanted to pose topless for what would one day be somebody's toilet seat cover. So we live, <laughs> we learn, we grow, and we change. I sure know I'm doing that through this month. We're kind of forced into it, aren't we? I felt like today when I got up, oh boy, this is the day you've really got to put on your armor and your marching boots because I have to do several things today that are really scary. The future is so uncertain that every decision we make, every step we take could be right, could be wrong, could be who knows what. And yet it's really interesting when we have to do that, we're able to do that. And what I pray is when we're through all of this and we're on another level and things are better, we'll still be able to um, draw on all of that courage and that strength. Stacy, oh my goodness, hi Stacy. 
you have beautiful skin. Do a video on your skincare routine. Well, I wish it were more of a routine and that I were more disciplined than I really am, but I'll sure tell you what I'm doing now. I will uh, throw that in tomorrow since you asked for it. Thank you so very much. And just at the end here, I want to let you know a couple of things happening. Uh, the blog this week at MainStreetVegan.net you can just go there and click on blog or do MainStreetVegan.net slash blog. The post is stunning. It's by Michelle Schaefer, who is a professional journalist and a uh, Main Street Vegan certified lifestyle coach and educator. And her post is called, Could COVID-19 Reboot Humanity? It, it's stunning. And I'm gonna read a little piece of it today as the intro to the Main Street Vegan uh, radio show and podcast. And then my guests will be Daniela Monet, who's an actor, I'm sure you've heard of her, and she's also a fabulous vegan entrepreneur. And she is in partnership with Ivana Lynch, whom we dearly love, for Kinder Beauty, which is a wonderful vegan beauty box that goes out every month. And then in the second segment, we'll have Dr. Aisha Akhtar. She is a medical doctor. She's also a public health expert. She's worked with the US Army and she knows her stuff about epidemics and what started them and what caused them and what's the vegan connection. Because you know, as a vegan, I just want to say, well, look at this thing. This uh, eating animals and abusing animals has caused this awful thing. Let's all go vegan. Well, yeah, if that was enough of an argument and a clear enough and an accurate enough art argument, I'd be out shouting it from the rooftops. But what we're going to learn today from Dr. Akhtar is exactly what the argument is. Could COVID-19 bring us toward a vegan world? I don't know. We're also hearing about the horrible conditions that have caused slaughterhouse workers, they're calling them protein plants now, which is just an awful joke, slaughterhouse workers to develop the virus because of the close confines that they're in. The day that I spent in a slaughterhouse, my, my biggest surprise was that I came out at the end of the day with my heart breaking for the workers as well as the animals. I don't know a single little child who goes to sleep at night and says, when I grow up, I'm going to kill animals for a living. That's something that people are pushed into having to do because the people who want to buy the stuff don't want to do it. So prayers to those people and prayers to the animals. And maybe, maybe, as this wonderful post from Michelle Schaefer says, COVID-19 could reboot humanity. Thank you all so much. Hope to see you tomorrow. Tell your friends. Bye.